Humankind has always been fascinated with the darker side of itself. The very existence of this channel speaks volumes about the interest that true crime brings in. Serial perpetrators are often seen as a particularly riveting facet of humanity, and across the globe there are countless numbers of them, some identified, some not. In today's episode, we'll be shedding light on two bizarre cases of serial killers who never existed. But first, I'd like to thank established titles for sponsoring today's episode. Close your eyes and imagine you've just acquired a plot of land solely for yourself, finally securing ownership of a space that belongs to no one else on Earth. Alongside it comes a prestigious title a prefix of the highest regard, like the leading protagonists in the world's best folklore and fairy tales. You are now a lord or lady, with a parcel of land to your name. Making that dream a reality is the goal of the sponsor of today's video, Established Titles. Established Titles is a premiere project highlighting historic Scottish customs, harkening back to yesteryear, where landowners were referred to as lords and ladies. They restore this tradition to life by allowing customers to purchase as little as one square foot of land in Ardale, Aberdeenshire, Scotland to officially acquire their title of Lord or Lady, while at the same time raising awareness and fighting back against climate change. For every order they receive, established titles plants a tree through charities such as Trees for the Future or One Tree Planted, an endeavor meant to preserve the jaw-dropping wondrous woodlands all over the world and support the international reforestation efforts. Along with doing something for the environment and your respected title, you'll receive an official certificate fashioned with a unique plot number, exact coordinates, and a beautiful crest designed just for your plot of land. With the certificate, you'll be able to legally add the Lord or Lady title to any official documents, like credit cards, plane tickets, or even dating profiles. It's a perfect and easy gift idea too, especially for those hoping to honor their Scottish heritage and do something for the environment. Established Titles is running a huge sale right now, and if you use the code COLDCASE, you get an additional 10% off. Go to establishedtitles.com forward slash coldcase to get your gifts now. So head on over today, stake a claim in the name of environmentalism, and turn your fantasy into a reality by becoming a lord or lady and purchasing Scottish land through established titles. And now let's dive in with today's mysteries. Lucian Staniak, aka the Red Spider. Lucian Staniak was, for a period of time, recognized as one of Poland's most vicious serial killers. A young man who preyed upon teen girls, he is often described as Poland's Jack the Ripper, because although he didn't target sex workers, he severely mutilated his victims in a way that rivaled the infamous serial killer who plagued Victorian London. On July 4th, 1964, the editor of a Warsaw-based magazine received a chilling letter written in red ink. The red scroll was described as being spidery, and read, There is no happiness without tears, no life without death. Beware, I am going to make you cry. Fearing for her life, the editor notified the police and received protection for a short time. But it wasn't her that the killer planned to attack. A few weeks later, on July 22nd, in the city of Olsztyn, a 17-year-old girl went out and never returned. Her naked body was found the following day by a gardener working in the park. She had been raped before death and disemboweled post-mortem. Two days later, another red-inked letter was sent, this time to a Warsaw newspaper. It read, I picked a juicy flower in Olsztyn, and I shall do it again somewhere else, for there is no holiday without a funeral. An analysis of the red substance on the note showed that it was a mix of artist's paint thinned with turpentine, 
This was a common mixture, and the ingredients themselves were run-of-the-mill, meaning that this information was useless to law enforcement. The next victim of the killer, who was already being dubbed the Red Spider for his red handwriting, was a 16-year-old girl who had hitchhiked home on January 17, 1965. She had been dropped just two blocks from her house, but never made it. A letter arrived shortly afterwards, informing her family and the police of where her body was located. The young girl was found in the basement of a leather factory near her home. She had been strangled using a wire garrote, and then, after death, had been violated with a metal spike, which had been left inside her body. The perpetrator struck again ten months later on November 1st. This time he targeted a hotel receptionist who went to a trucker terminal in Poznan to see if she could get a ride to her boyfriend's. However, she was met instead by the Red Spider, who chloroformed her, stripped her lower body, and raped her before stabbing her to death with a screwdriver. Her body was mutilated afterwards. The young woman was found shortly after her death, so law enforcement acted quickly and searched for a man wearing bloody clothes on various forms of public transport, including buses and trains. Unfortunately, however, they found no trace of their serial killer. The following day, a Poznan-based newspaper received one of the perpetrator's letters. It read, Only tears of sorrow can wash out the stain of shame. Only pangs of suffering can blot out the fires of lust. This quote is actually from a novel whose name translates as Ashes by Stefan Zaromsky. Despite the contents of the phrase, investigators didn't believe that the killer felt remorse, regrets, or shame for his actions. And they were right, because they struck again six months later. In May of 1966, the Red Spider attacked a 17-year-old girl who was out looking for her cat. Like his other victims, she left her home and never returned. Her body was discovered by her father, who came looking for her. She had been raped before death and mutilated afterwards. By this point, authorities had concluded that the killer didn't strike too close to his home. Most of the crimes had occurred in the west of Warsaw, in towns connected by direct rail lines to Katowice and Krakow. They estimated that the culprit was likely from one of these destinations. They also became aware of 14 other unsolved cases that they felt may be linked to him, although none of them were accompanied by his usual letters. The big break in the case came when three soldiers found the body of a 17-year-old girl on the floor of a train compartment. She had been murdered and mutilated on Christmas Eve of 1966. Law enforcement arrived on the scene and examined each passenger and worker, but they were unable to find any evidence or spot anything amiss. Inside the train's mail cart, however, they found a message that read, I have done it again. The compartment had reportedly been booked by a man using the name Stanislav Kozelski, and his wife, the 17-year-old victim, had picked up the tickets and paid for them. The girl was not married, and investigators found it odd that she had pretended to be the wife of the killer, assuming that the two were very familiar with each other for them to have acted like that. The husband's ticket had been inspected by the train conductor, but the conductor couldn't recall any significant details about the man that would help identify him. Shortly afterwards, investigators discovered that the girl's younger sister, who was 14, had also been murdered. Upon interviewing her parents, it was revealed that both siblings frequented an art university and club in Krakow, where they volunteered as models. Detectives received a list of the members and discovered that one man, a 26-year-old named Lucian Staniak, lived in Katowice. Staniak was a translator employed with Poland's government printing house. He travelled frequently for work and had a ticket for unlimited Polish rail travel. It was also found that he'd painted an image of a woman who had been mutilated, with flowers springing up from her wounds. On January 31st, investigators decided to arrest Staniak and went to his residence, but there was no one there. Unbeknownst to them, the Red Spider was out committing his final atrocity. He used a vodka bottle to smash an 18-year-old university student over the head, then removed the clothing from her lower body and mutilated her. He didn't realize that he'd left clear fingerprints behind on the bottle when he fled the scene. Staniak was promptly arrested on his return to Katowice, and in custody, he confessed to 20 murders. 
He claimed that his first was triggered when his sister and parents were killed by a motorist in bad weather. The driver was the wife of an Air Force pilot, and she was acquitted of the crime. Staniak knew he'd be the prime suspect if he killed her in revenge, so he instead targeted a young, blonde woman who resembled her. He stated that he enjoyed what he did so much that he didn't want to stop after he had started. Staniak was convicted of six murders in total, although he is believed to have been responsible for many more. He was sentenced to death, but his sentence was commuted when he was determined to be insane. In the early 2000s, he was still alive in a mental health facility where he continued to enjoy painting. The problem with this tale, despite the fact that the story has been published in several books, featured on various television programs, and in many podcasts, is that there is no official record of Lucien Staniak and no record of the Red Spider murders. In fact, it is largely believed to have been a work of fiction created by one of two crime writers, either Colin Wilson or Michael Newton. Both reportedly had a habit of embellishing facts. Colin Wilson in particular has been said to put sensationalism before everything else. Additionally, the reported address where Staniak was said to have lived does not exist in the city of Katowice. While it is unclear where exactly the story stemmed from, there appears to be no hard evidence for any of it, and yet it has been peddled as a true story the world over for more than 50 years. Sture Bergwall, formerly known as Thomas Quick. Sture Bergwall was born on April 26, 1950, in Farland, Sweden. One of seven children, he grew up in an extremely busy household amongst an inattentive family, with a depressed father and an overworked mother. He was also raised with strict Pentecostal beliefs. As a child, Bergwall describes himself as creative and ambitious, and notes that he was strongly interested in writing and theatre from a young age, but these interests were never nurtured. At the age of 14, he realised that he was gay. At this time, during the 1960s, homosexuality was seen as a psychiatric disorder, which led to Bergwell struggling to come to terms with his identity. According to one report, in his teen years, he met an older man who became his lover, but the man later took his own life. Aged 19, Bergwall himself was accused of molesting underage boys and was subsequently charged with the crime. He spent time in psychiatric care for his actions before being released back into society, where he re-offended, although this time he was charged with drug and assault-related crimes. He later went on to commit armed robbery, which landed him back in a psychiatric institute for the criminally insane in 1991. Around this time, Bergwall changed his name to Thomas Quick adopting his mother's maiden name, and began to confess to his therapist that he had committed a string of heinous crimes between 1964 and 1990 that occurred across Sweden, Norway, Denmark, and Finland. His alarming admissions caused his therapist to get in touch with the authorities, who came to interview him about his alleged crimes. One particular confession Bergwell made led to the solving of an 18-year-old case that was otherwise considered unsolvable. Additionally, his first admission concerned 11-year-old Johan Aspluna, a young boy who had vanished from school one day in November of 1980. His remains have never been found, and even today, his case is one of Sweden's most infamous. According to Bergwald's story, he abducted Johan from school, drove him to a secluded area, and sexually assaulted him before he dismembered and buried his body. Investigators searched for the 11-year-old's remains, but were unable to find any. And as a result, they spent nine years building a case against Bergwall that would secure his conviction. Another case he willingly talked about was from 1964, when Bergwall would only have been 14 years old. He claimed to have killed a boy the same age as him, who was shorter and weaker. It was discovered much later that Bergwall had a watertight alibi for the time of this murder. He was in church with his family in Phelan, 310 miles from the crime scene in Cronenberg County. He also confessed to the murder of Alvar Larsson, another notorious Swedish case that occurred in 1967, in which a 13-year-old boy vanished after leaving his family home to go for a walk. According to Bergwall's sister, however, 
Bergwall never left Phelan at the time that this crime occurred. One common theme emerged from the confessions that the police heard, the absence of a pattern. There was no M.O. Bergwall appeared to kill freely. He murdered and raped women, men, and children, using a variety of tools and weapons, carried out his crimes in numerous countries, and while he meticulously hid the bodies of some, others he left out so they would be found. His methods were most unusual in a serial killer, and in one particular case, Bergwall, despite being gay, claimed to have had consensual sex with one of his female victims before killing her. Perhaps the strangest part of everything was that no eyewitness could place Bergwall or someone matching his description to any of the crime scenes. Furthermore, no forensic evidence linked him to the crimes. His prints were never found on weapons, he held no trophies from his victims, his DNA failed to match that which was left behind at several scenes, and it was later revealed that he mostly guessed the correct answer to many of the questions he was asked by interviewers. Law enforcement decided to not reveal the fact that in several cases he had made multiple wrong predictions before landing on the right response. He also relied on the body language of interviewers to help him tell the story, and in some cases was simply fed the answers during his interrogations. Bergwell later admitted that, at the time, he was still allowed out on day release, and so he would research unsolved cases at the library so he was prepared for his interviews. Despite all the inconsistencies in this situation, Bergwall was convicted of eight murders in the 1990s. The evidence was based solely on his confessions, and there was nothing else available to tie him to the crimes. In 1998, he was convicted of the murder of a nine-year-old girl named Therese Johansson, who had gone missing 10 years earlier in Norway. This was the only case with physical evidence, the supposed bone fragments of a child. However, testing in 2012 showed that the fragments were not bone at all. They were comprised of wood and glue fused together. Presumably out of sheer incompetence, nobody had thought to test the bone fragments prior to Bergwald's trial. Notably, the fact that his confessions started out vague and became more detailed as he spoke with law enforcement was put down to the fact that he was recovering from repressed memories. When in reality, he was being told information and given access to case files prior to his trial. While those involved with the prosecution of Bergwall were satisfied with his testimony and convictions, not everybody was. Criminologists and some police officers critiqued the investigations, noting there was no single shred of evidence to connect him to the crime scenes. One officer in particular stated that unless Bergwall could produce a piece of evidence, something he had taken from a victim, then he was likely just a compulsive liar who had nothing to do with the murders and disappearances. He was also accused of lying by several of the families of his victims. In response to this, in 2001, Bergwall penned an article for a Swedish newspaper in which he stated that he refused to cooperate any further with the authorities in regards to all open murder investigations. Following this, he withdrew from the spotlight and changed his name from Thomas Quick and back to his original, Sture Bergwall. Seven years later, in 2008, while being interviewed by a documentary maker, Bergwall finally admitted that he had lied about everything. He claimed that he had not, in fact, taken part in any of the murders he had been convicted of and hadn't been responsible for anything that he had confessed to. By this point, he had admitted to around 30 disappearances and killings. After this, Bergwall hired a new lawyer and in the subsequent years had all eight of his convictions quashed. His old lawyer was heavily criticized for not better protecting his client. Bergwall was known to have mental health issues and the fact that he gained access to case files made him fully equipped to pull off false confessions while on trial. The handling of his admissions overall has been described as the most scandalous chapter in Sweden's crime history, while the police and prosecution have also come under fire for being lazy and incompetent. In 2014, The Confessions of Thomas Quick, a documentary about Bergwall, was released. In it, Bergwall admitted that he had confessed to the crimes for attention because he was unbearably lonely, stating, I was a very lonely person when it all started. I was in a place with violent criminals, and I noticed that the worse or the more violent or serious the crime, 
the more interest someone got from the psychiatric personnel. I wanted to belong to that group, to be an interesting person in here. He added that he was fed information by investigators, which helped him provide them and the courts with the correct narrative. It is also believed that Bergwall was incentivized to confess, because when he did so, he was given access to luxuries that he had not had before during his stay in the psychiatric facility, including his own office, a computer, internet access, and restaurant meals. After Bergwall was cleared of the crimes, it was also discovered that the dosage of drugs he'd been receiving could have led to a release of inhibitions, which caused him to invent the horrific stories he told. He explained to the Guardian that he was often high from the drugs, and said, I'd have lots of fantasies. My imagination would run wild. In one sense, they gave me a lot of creativity. It was like a vicious circle. The more I told, the more attention I got from the therapists and the police and the memory experts, and that meant I also got a lot more drugs. Bergwall also stated that while he was aware he was lying, he felt like he was in character as Thomas Quick, and almost believed the stories he told. As Thomas Quick, he regularly suffered from nightmares, self-harmed, and attempted suicide. Reportedly, as soon as he was taken off the drugs, he stopped confessing. Bergwall was released back into society after his convictions were quashed, as he was not deemed to be a danger to society or himself. While his care plan was mostly kept under wraps, he did, for some time, have to report for regular drug testing, and was advised to stay away from narcotics and alcohol. His lawyer stated that Bergwall's case raised serious questions about the entire legal system. For critics of the system, Bergwall was largely a troubled man who was plied with drugs and manipulated into confessing, but for those critical of the man himself, including the families of his supposed victims, he has caused nothing but pain and wasted time and resources that could have been spent investigating those cases themselves. And there you have the facts. Please leave a comment down below with your own thoughts and reactions, and remember to like this video and subscribe to support the channel. Thank you for watching. Stay alert, stay safe, and I'll see you next time.